Hey guys and welcome to a step-by-step -step tutorial where we're going to build an Impulse RC Apex from bare parts all the way up to this. If you follow this video step-by-step -step, you will literally have an exact replica of the aircraft that I go out and fly every single time that I go out and fly. So without further ado let's go ahead and go through the components that we're going to use and get to building because this is going to be a not crazy long process but it's probably going to take you a few hours as it's going to take me a few hours to do this. So first of all let's go ahead and talk about the frame that we're using. This is going to be an Impulse RC Apex. So this is the newest frame from Impulse RC. You can buy it without the electronics however in this particular video we're going to be using the electronics that come with this uh, Mr. Steel kit. So the Mr. Steel kit comes with extra electronics. You can also get a lightweight version that comes with aluminum hardware. Um, and it also comes with this brown or, or coyote brown style uh, plastic pieces. You do get the plastic pieces with the actual aircraft when you buy it as a frame kit only, but you can only get the brown ones if you buy the Mr. Steel kit, which, you know, hey, some people like that, some people don't, but the electronics are really what make it, make it different. Um, so we have our Impulse RC Apex and the Mr. Steel uh, add-on kit that gives you the electronics to work with KISS and uh, FET Tech, and also I'm pretty sure it works with Betaflight don't quote me on that but it's designed around KISS that's what I designed this around and speaking of KISS we'll talk about the ESC that we're gonna use um, and that is going to be this which is a box yes I know it's a 25 amp 4-in-1 from Flyduino and yes if you go on the website and you look it says hey 1 to 5s or sorry 2 to 5s um, it does run on 6s I've been flying it for about a year on 6s and it has no problems whatsoever without even any added caps if you follow the video exactly the way that I'm building it and you come out with the exact same weight and you're using the same setup, you shouldn't have any problems. Uh, if you're running a really heavy rig or you fly in like humid conditions and crash in wet grass all the time, then yes, you're probably going to have a problem, but that wouldn't be specifically a problem related to this kit. Flight controller, we're going to use a KISS V2, which I don't have out here right now. It's somewhere. I'll have to grab it. Um, so a KISS V2 flight controller and a KISS 25 MPSC. Uh, what we're going to do for motors is the new Mr. Steel V3 Stouts. So these are 1750 kV and the stator size is 2306. Um, the, I like to call these Oreos. They're like black top, white middle, black bottom. So those are the motors that we're going to be using and that again is going to be geared towards 6S because that is what I fly only exclusively. I don't fly 4S whatsoever. It's all 6S. So 25 volts. 1750 kV motor that seems to be the sweet spot for efficiency and not drawing too many amps when I went to 1800 and test motors There's a little too much amp draw and 1700 wasn't enough for something You know, I flew 1700 for a while wanted to try something a little bit better a little bit higher and not necessarily better as far as power is concerned um, And 1800 was too much. So 1750 is the one that I went with as far as the camera that we're talking about um, This is going to be a run cam mini now the run cam mini they are kind of working on something new with the case design and this one is pretty hard to find so just be on the lookout I am working with run cam trying to make one of these cameras a little bit more accessible this particular camera is a run cam mini swift 2 and it has a GoPro 2.5 millimeter lens on it so if you were to look for that lens specifically it would be an RC 2.5 G which stands for run cam 2.5 millimeter GoPro and it is literally a 2.5 millimeter GoPro lens from a Hero 2 and you can screw that directly into most FPV cameras as long as they have the larger thread. So that is the camera that we're going to be using today. And again, it is a CCD camera. I am not a huge fan of CMOS at this particular time. And this, at this particular time, I still like CCD. As far as flips and rolls are concerned, I can definitely notice a difference in latency. And it may just be perceived latency, but I just really like the way that CCD cameras fly. Um, as far as your receiver setup, we're going to deal with a Crossfire Nano receiver. So this is like super tiny receiver and we're going to use the stock whip and turn it into something like this, which is going to be your little Immortal L, which is some custom thing that I make out of heat shrink that I've been doing for a few years now and haven't had any issues with. So that's the antenna that I'm going to be using because again, this is an exact replica of the aircraft that I fly every day. So you want it exactly like the aircraft that I have. I'm going to show you how to do that. If you don't like that, you can adjust things, but again, Results may vary because when you start adjusting things and changing things, then you start adding weight and yeah, this is the lightest setup that I can possibly make and these are the reasons why I do the things that I do to keep weight down. So if you're questioning something that I'm doing, why is he doing that? Well, probably either because I found that it's the most durable way to do something or it's the most lightweight way to do something. As far as uh, transmitters, we're talking about 
a Unify 5 volt, and this is a tiny little, you know, version 3 5 volt Unify video transmitter from Team Black Sheep. And as far as video transmitting antenna, we're going to be using the Triumph Pro, which is their new antenna. It's a little smaller, a little lighter. I think it shaves about, I don't know, I want to say 8 grams off of the original. And this is the SMA version. And we have the SMA version on the, um, on the transmitter as well. And I will talk to you guys about that in a little bit when we get into building the frame because it is specifically designed for this exact setup. So to kind of give you a little bit of a background before we dive into this, Sean and I at Impulse RC have been developing this frame for about a year and a half now. Um, I've been talking to him about specific things that I wanted. So the Apex is designed solely around what I wanted in like a new version of an alien. So when you talk about like why things are a certain way, usually they're a certain way because I wanted them a certain way and they, you know, we found either a compromise whether or not it worked specifically for me or if it just worked better in general for like mass marketing, maybe like different camera sizes and whatnot. So all of the stuff that's on the Impulse RC Apex is either directly related to me asking Sean to make it that way um, but yeah, this is a frame specifically designed for my needs when flying FPV, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have a very similar needs. I need to carry a GoPro. I need it to be five inch. I need it to have same geometry as an alien. I need it to fly uh, extremely well for a long period of time, AKA being durable. Um, it needs to be very stiff, and this frame is extremely stiff, a lot stiffer than an alien, and also a lot more durable. You also shave weight. When you're talking about building this versus building an alien there's a lot less hardware in this kit so without further ado let's go ahead and open up some of this stuff and get into the build process all right so let's go ahead and open up the frame uh, again this is going to be your frame kit the mr steel portion over here is going to be sold separately or you know comes in a different bag you do have a warranty with the apex frame so you know when you buy this you have this, uh, you whatever this little code thing right here. It's a two-year warranty. Um, yeah, look into that if you're if you're curious about it. But just know that this frame does have a warranty. Uh, this is something that I specifically asked asked for, asked for. This is something I specifically asked for is having this Velcro strip rather than this thing right here. You save a couple grams when you use the Velcro. So we'll just go ahead and set that aside. But just know that that is going to be used. You can use whatever you want, but this is what I use. These are what we are going to use. These are little wire covers for your ESC wires. We'll get into that a little bit more a little later. Uh, as far as the carbon goes, this is going to be your top plate. Here's one of your bottom plates. Here's another bottom plate. Here are your arms. And again, you should be able to step by step your way through this with me. Like, so yeah, if you just follow what I'm doing, you'll be good to go. All right, so when you have everything out, this is pretty much what you should be left with. Um, you got your, t your bottom plates, your top plate, your forearms, your little plastic, or sorry, it's actually metal. This is going to be where your video transmitter mounts. And you got your standoffs, and you got uh, all of your hardware and whatnot. So let's go ahead and press in our aluminum nuts. All right, guys, so some of this stuff has changed since I got uh, my very first one, but you need to sink these in, which are going to be your, like, 
locking washer situations. So there's four that go in the arms themselves. It comes with this little tiny um, steel screw. Use a steel screw preferably if you're getting the aluminum kit because you will be putting a little bit of force. So there's a hole within this arm right here as you can see. You want to put this little lock, lock nut in there and then come from the other side tighten it. Usually there's a little washer thing in here that so you don't scratch the carbon um, but I don't know where that is so I'm just it's not scratching it at all so anyways do that with your forearms and then this is the top bottom plate so there's two bottom plates it's a split deck system on this quad so what you want to do is when you're putting these in please make sure that these um, kind of I forget what you call it, like uh, in cut pieces are on the bottom side. So you want to make sure that the lock nut is on the opposite side of these recessed cuts in this plate. So I'll talk about those recessed cuts here in a second. But yeah, you want to make sure that you're, and again, don't use a crazy amount of force. You just want to kind of get it to where it's flush. And this is some thin carbon, so you're not really dealing with a lot of like pressing and having to put a lot of pressure on it. So here's the top bottom plate again and uh, yeah what you're going to be doing is basically taking these lock nuts and putting them on the opposite side of these recessed holes on the bottom. If you look at these recessed holes you may notice that they do look kind of familiar as far as size is concerned and you got a 30 by 30 mounting point and you got 20 by 20 mounting point so if you want to run a 20 by 20 ESC or 20 by 20 flight controller or if you want to run standard size size stuff you can so again we have those in there now um, we can go ahead and put in the um, the flight controller standoffs let's go ahead and do that we're going to be using these four little in this particular case they're going to be aluminum these aluminum um, bolts here and we're going to be using four Oh, that's a nylon one. We're going to be using four aluminum um, nylon lock nuts. So go ahead and locate those pieces. Again, there's four of each. There's nylon lock nuts, and then there's also these kind of tapered style um, screws or bolts. Here we go. And where's the last one? All right. So again, that's what we're going to be dealing with, four lock nuts and four tapered screws. So in my particular case, I'm going to be running a 30 by 30 flight controller. So again, I will slip these bolts in, making sure that the, cha the uh, tapered portion goes in. We're going to be going on the outside four because that is the 30 by 30 mounting points. And we're going to be putting these nylon lock nuts on top. Okay, so the tools that we're going to be using are, I didn't mention earlier, but this is a 2.5 millimeter Allen with that, uh, the thing where we lock these guys in, and this is going to be a 2 mil Allen, and we're also going to need a 5.5 millimeter tool that is basically for these hex nuts. So we're going to go ahead and tighten these down. You don't have to tighten them crazy tight, we just want to get them snug. These are aluminum screws and aluminum nuts, so again, please don't over tighten anything because aluminum is not the strongest metal in the world but it is a dang light one so again go ahead and tighten these down Okay, now that we've got that done, this is what you should be looking at. You have your four mounting points for your flight controller and your and your uh, ESC, really. 
on the bottom here and then you have these four screws which are the ones that hold the arms onto this bottom plate so yeah this is the top plate and it is ready to accept the arms and the bottom plate as a sandwich so let's go ahead and do that this is our front bottom plate this is where the bottom of the camera mounts and then this plate with all these nuts and bolts is going to go essentially like that and it will be a split deck system very much like the reverb so since this is our bottom piece what we're going to do is we're going to kind of line the arm up in here and just scope it out so what you're going to use to uh, mount these arms to this bottom plate is going to be these four screws right here so what we're going to do is we're going to this thing is pretty ambidextrous like you can use either side um, but we're going to take the outer bolt sorry the inner bolt and we're going to screw this into the arm and we're just going to kind of get it you know semi loose in there these are 2.5 millimeter bolts so I've got one of those in there let's just go ahead and screw the rest of these in when we get to the fourth one I'll show you uh, something specific because there is a key that goes in here so we've got two in let's go ahead and put three in okay now that we've got three in you want to kind of loosen them up if they weren't already loose because we got to put our our little key in before we can put the fourth one so we want to get these things kind of lined up and then there's a little carbon fiber key that helps hold all this stuff together we're gonna to take this carbon fiber key we're gonna kind of slot it in and it probably will take some uh, some coercion to get in there so I got the key in with two with three arms in there. We're going to go ahead and put this fourth arm on. This was kind of the most finicky port part of the build for me. Uh, mainly because it's kind of a tight fit. So And all of that can happen. There we go. Okay, so I got the key in. The key is locked in. We've got all four arms. They're still all pretty loose. We want to just make them a little bit snug, but not tighten them all the way. And that's going to be with the key in and all of these arms. This was the tedious, most tedious section of this build, mainly just because getting the key in can be a little bit tricky. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take this top bottom plate, which again has our little aluminum mounts our, our, for our ESC, and it's already got our, um, our lock nuts in there. And we're going to place that on top, and we're going to take these bolts, which are not threaded all the way through. They're actually smooth in the middle, and then they have threads on the end. We're going to take those, and we're going to insert those on the outside um, of this arm, and then thread that into this lock nut thing. A lot of guys are putting these little um, like load distributors on the outside. Uh, I do it on the outside, I just forgot on those two. So I'll go ahead and put those on the little load distributor thing. You just slip it over the top of this bolt and then slip it into the arm. And what it's supposed to do is just supposed to widen the amount of pressure that goes on this bottom plate and give you a little bit of load distribution so that there's not as much of a spike or not as much of a sharp spot of load right at the end of these arms kind of spaces it out and gives you a little bit more structural rigidity so again we've got all of our bolts in our top and bottom plates are joined now again this this won't fit if you don't do the first couple steps correctly mainly because like I said, those recessed screws that we put in earlier that you're going to put the flight controller and the ESC on, those things are specifically designed to be recessed into the actual top bottom plate, if you will. Uh, so you got to make sure everything's in there or it's not going to fit flush. 
So here's the bottom section. You can see there's a little bit of stuff going on in there, but yeah, it's all put together correctly. We have the top bottom plate on, we have the front bottom plate on, and we have the arms locked in, and this thing is super, super rigid. I don't even have it tight all the way yet, and I can barely, barely, I can barely flex it. So uh, that is going to be the aircraft frame assembly portion. We can go ahead and tighten these up, and probably at the end, before I go out and fly this thing, um, you know, I want to make sure everything fits first, and then I'll go back later and put on some Loctite, because after flying this thing for, I don't know, about three or four months now, or not even that long, really, about three months now, uh, I've noticed that over time these can come loose, not completely fall out, but they do get a little bit of loose because there's very few screws and bolts holding these things on. So just I would put some Loctite on this. I know it comes with Loctite, but I would you know reapply um, and also just check your bolts periodically because these can potentially get loose. But again, these things are just big vibration machines, so that's not anything out of the ordinary. I always checked my bolts on uh, on the Alien as well. So with that done. Let's go ahead and uh, put the ESC on. So let me go ahead and get that out. Here's our ESC, which is a KISS 25 amp 4-in-1. I'm going to clear some of this stuff to the side so that we can uh, prep this ESC and get it installed. Go ahead and turn our iron on. I have my soldering iron set at 850 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I like the iron to be hot. Some people are going to say, hey, no, that's really hot, but, you know, whatever. I, I like it to be hot. I will also show you a trick with the flight controller and the, e, uh, and the ESC to make it a little bit more durable. Um, and this has just been something that I found over time kind of helped with durability. So, what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to take the flight controller. And I'm going to take one of these files. Uh, you, you get files here, but I don't know. That's a little small. So, if you have an alien or something, you don't have to do this. This does fit on here with a little bit of force. Um, but I like it to not be super tight. See how it's kind of tight on there? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this file and I'm just going to file out the ESC a little bit in the original mounting hole. I'm just kind of wallering out the hole, if you will, to make it a little bit wider and a little less snug on the actual flight control standoff. Because it is metal and it does see a lot of tension if you're if you don't file these out. So you know this could be some durability prevention as far as like if I'm ever gonna have a problem. Because basically on on mini quads, the tighter stuff is, the more often it's gonna break. So you don't have to do anything crazy, but just file out this a little bit, and you'll see how. Nicely it fits on there now. It's actually a little loose, which is good because we're going to be sandwiching it down. So I do the same thing with my ES or my yeah, my my FC, the flight controller. But yeah, we want it to be a little bit loose on there. And I also have been running a little bit of a rubber grommet underneath here. Um, hopefully I'll have that in the description below. We talked about putting a flight controller style like soft mounting your ESC. But in reality, you're just giving it a little bit of a buffer. So I have these little um, rubber donuts that I'll put a link to in the description below. And where I'm going to slip a couple of those. They're actually really soft. It's not anything specifically for soft mounting the flight, con flight controller or ESC. It's mainly to just put a little bit of a buffer between the ESC and all of the solid mounted stuff. So put those little donuts on. I'm going to tin the ESC up. And uh, then we'll go ahead and install that because there's not really anything else to do other than to tin it up. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. So we'll get some solder, get our iron hot.
And guys, the whole trick with soldering is to get in and get out as quickly as possible. So you want the iron hot and you want to get in there, get some flow on, and then get out. Don't hold the iron on there too long and don't touch any of the other components. Just get in there, don't breathe the smoke, and you're good. You can check the other side and you know if you're really anal like I am, you can go ahead and tin the other side too so that you have complete coverage on all of this copper. And again, this is going to be exactly like my setup, and I don't mount the ESC the way that everybody mounts it. So we have our ESC tinned. We want to go ahead and open up our electronics pack now so that we can get our, um, our little lead for the um, we'll just go ahead and grab this now and I'll, I'll talk about whatever else is in there later. So we have our lead right here which is going to be our XT60 lead and we want to solder this onto this flight controller. So what I'm going to do hopefully if this gets wide enough I'm going to open this up. So I'm going to solder this on right here. And again, red is positive and black is negative. I know from experience that I want it to be a little bit shorter than it is. So I'm going to cut off about half an inch off of the, the positive and a little less off of the negative so that it's about wee long, actually maybe a little more. So if you want exact measurements, two inches on the red and a little over about two, almost two and a half on the uh, black. So a little over two inches on positive and about a quarter inch more on the negative. And that should be good you find out later in this video that it's not good you can blame me but it should be good so we strip the ends here go ahead and tin them again we want to make sure we're getting in and out and we're flowing all the way through this wire Okay, we're always cleaning the tip of the iron. Um, all right, so we're gonna go ahead and tin this on. Or not tin it on, but you know, put it on. So I'm gonna put it on if, if the ESC is like this and you have this uh, little connector here, I'm gonna put it on to where our wires are coming out to the side here. And I'm trying to flow everything. I'm trying to get everything to flow. This is probably the hardest part of this build as far as you can mess things up if you do this incorrectly. Uh, mainly because it's just, there's a lot of really tight electronic components all right next to each other. And you're dealing with soldering, which a lot of people are not as gifted at. And what I'm doing now is just making sure those joints are really good. And uh, also making sure that they're not bridged together by any means. And you're going to end up with something like this. And that is kind of popped off to the side there for a reason. Again, this is going to be slightly different than what uh, Impulse RC is going to tell you to do because I build my quads differently. I run the the ESC motor wires out the sides versus the original setup is like that, which I don't like. I prefer it to be more like this. So this is how we have it set up. We've got our sides tinned and we've got our uh, power lead attached. We've also hollowed out the ESC itself. 
All right, so now that we have this done, I'm gonna go ahead and open up the electronics box because that's pretty much what we're gonna be dealing with next. So if you open up your electronics bag um, in the Mr. Steel kit, you're gonna get something that kind of looks like this. You got some standoffs, you got a little baggie that's gonna be full of two PDBs and a couple little LED strips and whatnot. Go ahead and open these up. One PDB, two PDBs. Don't forget your little butt plug that I almost forgot that's gonna plug into the side here. There's a tiny little butt plug that comes with your um, with your OSD PDB that you can plug in the side of the uh, you can plug into the side of that USB port so you don't get a bunch of grass in it. Don't throw that away. I almost just did. And then you got your your wires here, and you got your plastic pieces. We'll get to those in a little bit. You got your foam. So really, you're talking about these PDBs right here. You got your OSD PDB, which has the microphone and one plug on it and a USB port. And then you have your regulator PDB, which is completely blank on one side. And then on this side has a big Molex connector and a bunch of regulators on it and an LED. Then you also have these, which are going to be your standoffs, which we're gonna end up putting on top of the ESC, which we will go ahead and do that now so that that is no longer flippity floppity on the, um, on the aircraft itself. So we're taking these guys which are our little rubber standoffs. And we're gonna push down on the ESC again. This has the little rubber grommets underneath it. We have it set up to where it, the actual pigtail is coming out in the back of the aircraft. This is where your camera goes. This is the back of the aircraft. We're gonna take this guy, screw him on here. And we can do that for all of these. So, and I'm just going to hand tighten them. No need to like romp down on them. I mean, I'm getting them snug, but we're not going like super tight. Just make sure they're pretty evenly snug. Okay, so we got our standoffs on there. We are ready to, uh, honestly, we could mount the electronics right now, or we could put the motors on. I feel like motors are pretty easy later, so let's just go ahead and do the electronics setup. So you have this wiring harness here, and you have another little pigtail here. Now, what you're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and open up our flight controller. So, if I have my flight controller, we'll just open this up so that you can see all of the electronics next to each other. So we have our flight controller that's gonna sit here. We have our little uh, regulator PDB, which is actually gonna sit back here. And then we have our OSD PDB, which is gonna sit right behind the camera. So, first of all, let's just go ahead and mount the regulator PDB. Um, because this is going to be a pretty easy thing to mount and it would be easier if there's not as much stuff on the actual aircraft itself. So what we're going to use is we're going to use these little recessed screws. They're like little two mils and you got a little, little couple lock nuts for those and you also have a couple little plastic spacers. So we have four of these guys four little lock nuts, and then we have four little plastic spacers as well, which you'll find somewhere in your kit, which I'm struggling. There we go. There's two, three, and four. So this is the hardware that you're going to be using. Again, four little recessed screws, four lo nylon lock nuts, and four little spacers. So if I go ahead and put those there, how we're going to mount this is we're going to take one of these screws put it in the back, you see it's recessed. It's actually a 1.5 millimeter Allen. So you can go ahead and, you know, that's what you're gonna use. But we don't need that tool yet. We're gonna hold that in with our finger. We're gonna put on this little plastic spacer here, which in this particular case, I might need to use this tool because these plastic spacers are pretty tight. So I'm just gonna have to screw this plastic spacer on. So once I get the plastic spacer on, we'll just repeat this step three more times. plastic spacer and I don't have fingers strong enough to hold that little plastic spacer 
So I'm going to use a pair of needle nose. No, I'm not. I'm going to use a pair of duck bills. Probably a pair of duck bills that's got grip. Gonna use a pair of duck bills to grab this spacer. Screw this on here. Again, just repeating this process until we have all of these in here. And we can go ahead and mount our regulator board. See, like some of these are a lot easier than others. It's just tolerances on that plastic piece, which is super tiny. All right, so we've got our four little plastic uh, spacers on there with our four little screws. We're gonna take our OSD, or this is our regulator board, which is the big one that has the LED on the bottom and it's got this larger Molex on it. We're gonna place it face down to where the Impulse RC symbol is up. You'll notice that the LED sits flush in the bottom right there. And then all we're gonna do is we're gonna tighten it down with these nylon lock nuts. So we're gonna put four nylon lock nuts on the top here. And uh, I don't have a nylon lock nut tool that small, so I'm just gonna go ahead and use a pair of duck bills. Just be careful because, yeah, you're dealing with tiny electronics here and you're squeezing with a good amount of force to hold that lock nut. And again, we're not putting anything crazy under tension. I'm just snugging them down so that it doesn't move. And you don't want to put too much force anyways because you could strip out these little one mil things if you're going too hardcore. So again, just check the tightness on all these and we have our regulator board mounted. So now that we have our regulator board mounted, we're going to go ahead and file out the FC because this is also some little trick that I do like we did on the ESC itself. Sorry. Um, I'm going to take this file and I'm going to file out these holes, make them a little bit bigger so that it's not as tight on here. See, it's kind of tight. I want to make sure that it goes on there with very little effort. So again, we take our FC. And I'm kind of twisting and turning and we're filing out this hole to make it a little bit bigger. This again is a KISS FC V2. You don't usually want to slip out of the hole like that because it can uh, you know, cause a little bit of damage depending on how hardcore you are. So I'm just pulling, pushing the hole a little wider on the outside so that when I place it on here, it fits and there's no strain whatsoever. So again, remember before it didn't fit on there and now it fits on there with very little effort. So before we wanna go ahead and tin this, so I'll just tin the receiver, the three pads in the middle, the UART, the five volt and the ground. So we'll just go ahead and tin those so that when we go later to put our receiver on there, it's a lot easier. So again, I tend to these three in the middle, the UART, five volt and the ground and I accidentally touch this ground over here, but it doesn't really matter. Those three in the middle, the ones with the holes, the through hole pins on them are the ones that you want. Okay, so we've tinned that. And uh, now we can pretty much go ahead and start running our wiring harness. You're also gonna get these LED strips in here. I don't personally use these, but you could wire them and strap them to the outside of the aircraft. I don't use them, so we're not gonna deal with those right now. As far as your OSD board, there is a wiring diagram that I'm actually going to have to um, look at because I don't know it off the top of my head, but I know right now that I can tin these, and let me go ahead and find this wiring diagram. So if you look at this OSD board, this microphone's on the back, and we have our USB port to your right. Um, if you look at the board and read it from left to right, you're going to look at VTX control, audio out, um, 
video out, 7.5 volts, ground, 5 volts, video in, and cam control. So in my particular case, we're gonna pretty much be using the video in, the five volt, the ground, the video out, the audio out, and that's really it. We're gonna double up on the five volt and the ground for the video transmitter and the camera. I'll probably put a cam control on there as well, but I don't personally use it, so we don't have to do that. So let's go ahead and tin these up, and what the ones I'm going to tin are going to be the ground, which is the fourth in from the right, the five volt, which is the third in from the right, the uh, video in, which is the second from the right, and then we're going to go all the way over, skip a pin, or skip a t uh, tab, and we're going to go video out, and then also audio out. So when we're all said and done, we're gonna have those right there soldered. And yeah, you can go ahead and tin all of them if you want. Those are just the ones that I'm gonna use for this particular build. Because that's all that I use when I build these things anyways. I don't use cam control or anything like that. So when we talk about your video uh, and your like actual wiring harness itself, um, you have these two wires. So in theory, there would be one wire here, but since the wires are so thin, Sean thought it would be a good idea to go ahead and double up because this is powering your video transmitter and your camera and all that. So we can go ahead and take these wires, these two ground and uh, power wires, and twist them together because we are going to be using them as one. So I like to twist them together and, uh, and then depending on how long they are, you might go ahead and cut them and, and get them all because basically we're going to be setting them up like this. We're going to be plugging this in to here. This big Molex connector is plugging into the actual uh, regulator board, and then that's going to supply voltage and the right voltages and current to everything that we need. So I don't necessarily need these things to be this long. So I'm going to cut off probably a little over half, or not a little over, a little under half. So if you look at them, I'm going to cut about, I don't know, a quarter inch off, or a little, probably a half inch. Sorry for those people that don't speak Imperial, which I shouldn't, but I do, unfortunately. Just grew up with it. Sorry, guys. Wish we lived somewhere else that didn't have all this Imperial life, but the metric system isn't a thing in the United States. Unless you're a scientist or something. So, I'm going to just touch this here and we're going to go ahead and tin these wires because again you always want to make sure you tin everything before you try to solder it otherwise it's going to be a crappier solder joint than it could be so now that we've tinned both of these we can twist them together and make one unified point that we could again tin together if we really wanted to but I don't think it's necessary in this case so I'm going to take my uh, board here and I'm gonna solder these directly to our power wire. So I'm gonna go get it hot, make sure it flows, cause you don't want it to just be a surface mount. You wanna make sure it flows really nicely. At least enough to get something that you're comfortable with and you don't feel like it's gonna pull off. Cause that's never good when you when you get something that pulls out. Never pull out, I say. Okay. So I'm pretty comfortable with that one. Again, some of the soldering is going to be pretty tedious because it's small and can be a pain in the ass because you're dealing with expensive electronics and you can easily mess them up. So I like to flow a little bit of solder on before and then just kind of seep that nugget in there all right so we're good on that front we've got our ground and our power wires soldered on and at this point we could probably just go ahead and plug in this cable I may have to you know shoot myself in the foot later but I'm pretty sure we're gonna be okay so I'm gonna feed this little nugget in here and plug him in which is not too terrible of a task when it's all said and done. 
Just make sure you got the plug in the correct way. And yeah, there we go. So we've got our plug plugged into our regulator board, and we've got these two little nuggets coming off here, which, you know, at this point, if it were me, I would go ahead and twist these wires up to keep down on interference because all power flowing through a wire is creating some kind of current that can ultimately mess things up. So now, which one of these plugs in where and how long of a cable you need, you may have to untwist these. So uh, yeah, these, let's see, which one plugs into what? This one is too big. And this one does plug in. So I didn't know this until now, but this is a very cool feature. <laughs> if you want to plug in the wrong Molex connector, you can't because they're all specifically made and they're all certain sizes. And yeah, you can't plug it in wrong. I mean, I'm sure you can if you really tried, but this one has one more connector than this Molex connector, so it's not going to go in there. Now there was this other little wire that came with it that looked like this, which is essentially a straight through thing that we were talking about. Um, you know, when you're basically going to use this to mount your ESC, connect it to your actual flight, or sorry, your ESC to your flight controller. So what we're going to do is we're going to go from PDB. We're going to make sure we plug that guy in right there. So we're PDB. If you're looking at it from the top, it's the one on the bottom side of this little reset button and it says PDB right here in the corner and that's actually going to plug in to your ESC right here and it can only go in one way unless you force it and uh, again I don't mount this in a th in the typical way I have the ESC flipped and done all kinds of different ways this is the way that I'm mounting it so if you're following this video to a T mount it this way I have the connector on top in the front I have the connector here for your actual lipo in the back and I'll show you how I mount that and protect this from ripping off later and we have our motor wires here and I have my flight controller like this and the flight controller is actually going to sit in its original orientation where front is front so this is basically how it's going to look when we have it all together um, I might put one extra twist in there maybe that's too many we'll see you gotta just make sure everything's not super tight so I did put a twist in there I kinda like it it's not super tight we might take one of those twists out just to make it a little less we're gonna run this guy under here in my case I wanna do that and we're gonna actually plug in this cable to the flight controller here on the side the one that says SER so this is a flight controller KISS V2. So it says SER, we're going to plug that in to our harness, and we're going to plug in PDB directly to the actual ESC itself. These are the same size Molex connector, so technically you could plug those in backwards. I don't know what happens if you do, so please don't. And yeah, SER goes to our harness, and then PDB goes to the actual ESC itself. Now I'll figure out how to wire this to where it's going to be, you know, tidy in my case it looks like this we have our again SER in the front and our PDB in the back going directly to the ESC itself and we're gonna take our nylon little nuts that come with it and we're gonna put those on top this is probably the like the complex section of the build. Everything else is very simplistic. Um, wiring, soldering up the motors and whatnot is very easy, but you know, setting all this stuff up, making sure you solder everything correctly, um, isn't necessarily hard. But you just got to make sure you're paying attention because if you do it wrong, you can mess things up and cost yourself a good amount of money. So. We've got all that put up. I'm just going to snug those down because I don't need to take that off again. We can put our receiver on um, without having to take that off again. So here's where we are right now. We've got our, S our FC and our ESC mounted. We've got everything soldered up. So technically, if I were to power this on right now, we would get power to the ESC and to the flight controller. They wouldn't make a beep because the motors are actually what makes the beep. But yeah, that is where we're at right now and let's go ahead and get the camera and receiver 
setup. We'll do the receiver first because it's going to be a little bit out of the way, and then we'll do the camera. All right, so I'll move this out of the way. We're going to get the receiver set up. So if I cut this open, pull our nano crossfire receiver out. This frame is specifically designed for the Immortal T, so if you look at the plastics that come with it, there's this one piece in there that looks like this that's actually designed to mount with Immortal T. So you can check another build video out if you want to do that. I don't use the Immortal T, um, but I guarantee you that's a very clean uh, setup, but I just personally don't use it, so I'm not going to do that. So here is our Nano Crossfire receiver. I put it on something so you can see how tiny it is. Uh, I got to tin this and put some wires on it so that we are able to solder this directly to the um, directly to our flight controller. And this is not supposed to be that far out, but hey, when you're soldering an ESC and you want it to be clean, you do things that you don't normally do. All right, so let me put this in here. I'm going to open that up. Actually, let's get a taller one. Get this going in there. I'm sure people are going to ask about this little wooden thing. It's called a solder buddy. They don't make them anymore. I talked to the guy about making them. They're expensive because they're handmade. No one would buy them. So, yeah. I'm sorry. They're not going to be made. This thing would cost you like $50 for a piece of wood. No one's going to pay that. So, <laughs> if you want one... I'm sorry, but so there we go. We got ground on the outside, followed by power, followed by the RX, and then followed by the white on the end, which I think is the control. We just want to make sure these are good to go, make sure they're all tight and nice they're not gonna fall out make sure the solder is nice because this is our control link again so if you mess this up it's gonna be a bad day we want to measure this just kind of generically go ahead and cut a little strip off and protect it with some heat shrink I'm gonna walk over here and heat gun this real quick the heat gun is not in frame so I will be back All right, so we were heat gunned, and uh, yeah, this is how it looks. We got our cable set up. What we're going to do is we're going to mount this and uh, solder it to our flight controller. So what I need to do is I need to cut off about an inch of that, strip these ends, and get them ready by tinning them to solder directly to the flight controller. This is some of the few solder joints that you're going to have to make, and if you... Remember earlier, I tend the three things on the flight controller. Um, uh, there's a fourth one, this big pad right here. If you want to run that white cable, which I don't even know what it does, but hey, I have it on there, so I'm going to run it through. I think it's for if you want to run like Lewis scripts and crap like that. Let's go ahead and tend these so that they don't fray out on us when we're going through there. So we're tinned kind of shimmy in underneath here I've never had this much trouble getting some wires underneath the flight controller but hey I guess since you're doing it on camera stuff gets real real fast so what I'm gonna do is shift that underneath spread these fillet these out we're gonna go power which is 5 volts there we're going to go ground, which I wouldn't recommend to doing it in this order because it's kind of awkward now that I have to solder in the middle. And we're going to do UART 1, and then we're going to do the white wire right there. So, again, this is how it's set up. White wire, 5 volt, UART, and ground. And those solder joints are all great. As far as uh, the quality of them, I'm not going to worry about that shit popping off. <laughs> That's, that's funny, that reminds me of a TikTok thing. Um, next, I'm going to take a piece of double-sided sticky tape. 
I'm going to put it on the bottom of this little nugget right here. I'm going to actually clip it off. And this is what's going to hold the uh, this is what's going to hold the receiver on. I'm going to take this double-sided sticky tape, use a razor blade to get this the double-sided off. I'm going to put it on top of this guy and I'm just going to smash that down and that's literally what's going to hold the receiver in place right on top of our regulator board. So, we've got that all mounted. Let's go ahead and start working on the camera itself. So camera plates, if you want to get all specific, the camera plates are going to mount like this. There's only one mounting point on the bottom, and it mounts like that, and the other camera plate mounts like this, and then you have this little PDB that mounts right behind the camera. But let me go ahead and open the camera up and show you guys what all that means when it's all done, because it does look, it's very tidy, but it's also it also can be a pain in the butt depending on who you are and how much patient, patience you have. So, uh, what we need is we need this cable, which is going to be the power to the actual camera itself. We could technically use this cable, which you know I, I probably would recommend for now because what we're going to do is I'm going to delete some stuff that's on the actual OSD from the factory, but it just depends on how you want to do it. So I'm going to plug this cable in and just kind of see what's what. So we got our little OSD thing here. We got our cam control and we have our power and ground. So like I said earlier, all of this stuff is super nicely built and we can get away with all of these cables being super short. So I'm not gonna shorten them too crazy right now, but I'm probably gonna leave about an inch on the actual cam itself as far as the four main connectors go. So we can go ahead and cut those. And to be fair, probably cut a little bit more because it's gonna be real short. And this is why the video on this frame is so good is because not only is there very little distance between the actual video coming in from the camera going to the video transmitter but it's also super um, super highly regulated with cascade regulators so you have a switching regulator giving you the right power but then you have a linear regulator giving you cleaner power because switching regulators are super dirty as they are turning off and on at a rapid pace to give you um, to give you the voltage that you desire so again we're going to go here, and I'm just going to look at this. I'm going to go ahead and open up the video transmitter as well because it's going to just be nicer to solder all this on at once instead of soldering soldering it on later. So let's go ahead and pop the video transmitter out, get our cable out. Um, we can set the video transmitter aside for now. We're not going to deal with it, but we are going to deal with the actual cable itself. So if you look at this connector, there's a smaller Molex connector. You want to make sure that that's the one that you're plugging into the video transmitter. And we're going to cut that at about an inch from the video transmitter itself. We can discard the other side, but this is the side that we want, video transmitter and that tiny little section of wire right there. Sorry for the mess. I am a freaking mad scientist when it comes to having things on my desk when I'm building. I don't know why. I'm sure a lot of you guys are like that as well. It just comes kind of par for the course. Alright, so we've got that right there. I'm going to go ahead and tin all of these and make sure we are ready to accept this to our board here. I'm going to go ahead and pop up this little wiring diagram once again. We're gonna go video transmitter stuff first. So I need to solder five volts and ground first. And I'm gonna go ahead and do that. So five volt is third from the end. So I'm gonna go ahead and solder that five volt and then ground is the one directly next to it. And we can go ahead and solder on our uh, video, sorry, our camera wires too. So we're gonna basically double up on the camera because we're coming five volts out to the camera as well in my case so I've soldered on that and just make sure you've got two good connections it's also helps to put a little bit of solder on the tip itself because then it flows 
a little nicer and gives you more of a bead that captures both wires usually. So let's go ahead and dab that. And one of them fell off. So just dab that. Okay. So we've got both ground and power dabbed on there. I'm pretty happy with both of those connections. We maybe could fix the power one, make it a little better. All you want to do is just make sure they're not um, they're not bridged together, and just make sure that both wires are in there. So we've got both wires in there now. We can twist them or do whatever you want to do with them. Um, I would probably twist them a time or two just to kind of separate them. Now we're going to run video transmitter out of one side. So we have video out, which is just directly on the other side of the pin that we didn't solder. I know this is very confusing, but I'll show you in the end and we'll go over it. So I'm going to solder on this, which is our video out, which is our yellow wire. And then our audio out is going to be the next wire in line, which is second from the end on the video transmitter side. And we can go ahead and screw those or twist that around. And then on our camera side, I forgot to tin the camera control pad, which is on the very end, close to the USB port. So we're going to go yellow wire right here, which is second end from the uh, USB port, which is going to be our camera. Um, that's video in, and then our cam control is actually going to go on the very last pad. And then we can twist that as well. And what you're left with is this really tidy harness that looks like this. So again, this is our video transmitter plug, and this is our camera plug. We have audio first, then video, then a blank spot where 7.5 volts is. Then we have ground where we doubled up both of them. Then we have 5 volts where we doubled up both of them. Then we have our camera in, and we have our camera control. And then this goes to the camera OSD board, which we're going to use later to remove some of the OSD that's on the run cam, because I don't like all of the stuff that they give you that's on from the factory. As far as this is concerned now, we can go ahead and we can plug this back in. Get this guy out of here to make our lives a little bit easier. Make sure you plug in the thing the right way. Don't force anything. Okay, we plug that guy in and uh, we're pretty much ready to mount the camera. Alright, so what we're going to do next is we're going to mount the camera. How we're going to do that is we're going to take our side plates here and we're going to go into our little camera bag that had a little baggie of hardware that I have seemingly misplaced. Here it is, a little baggie of hardware. And we're going to dump out our little baggie of hardware. Or not dump it out all the way, but you can take four of the shorter screws. So there's a, a bunch of sh uh, screws in there. You're going to take out some of the shorter ones. They're not the shortest ones, but they're all 1.5 mil. You'll figure it out. They're not. It's not too terribly complex in there. There's just four screws that are moderate length. They're not the shortest ones, like I said, but they're not the longest ones either. Um, yep, okay. And we're going to get our 1.5 mil driver. And we're going to take one of our side plates and make sure that the single mounting plate is on the bottom of the camera, which in this case, it says run cam RC 2.5G on the top. And we're going to line it up and kind of see how this goes. If I go too far down and use the top two mounting screws, then it's probably not going to fit because it's going to touch the bottom. So what we want to do is we want to use the bottom two mounting screws, the middle one and the bottom one. And we can go ahead and use one of these guys and put him through there and mount it directly in the center hole of this camera. We can go ahead and do that on both sides. Again, making sure that the single uh, like lock tab is on the bottom. So we're going to take another one of these screws, mount it on here. We're just keeping it loose for now. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take another one and we're going to mount it. We're going to put it on the bottom of the camera. And that one seems to be a tad short. So again, we don't want the longest ones in there, but we do want ones that are fairly long. And this one seems to be like it's going to do the trick. So, and we're going to put that in slightly loose. 
Again, do the same thing on the other side, and then we're gonna adjust the camera later, but for now, that's pretty much what you need to do. So we're adjusting that. The camera is loose in these K plates, but both screws are in so that we can adjust that later. I don't need the shortest screws. I didn't use the shortest ones, so you don't need those. Just the medium sized ones and you'll figure it out. It's pretty self-explanatory. So now what we could do is we can mount this, but I feel like what we're gonna have to do to really make it work is we're gonna have to put the standoffs on, otherwise it's not gonna stay in place. So we're gonna grab two, there's like four, there's a bunch of different length standoffs. The longest ones are the ones that are gonna go up front. So we have four of those. And we're also gonna bust out our plastics at this point. So in the Mr. Steel kit, there comes this little kit of plastics right here. We're not gonna use this one because that's the one that goes on the back for the Immortal T, which we're not using. So you got four of these, which go under the arms and they're like skids, they go under the motors. We'll put those on in a little bit. But then you got this one, which is called the little chin mount. It's not actually called that, but it is a chin mount. And uh, it goes underneath the bottom plate to kind of protect. So it's gonna go there. And the only thing that we're gonna use steel bolts on is actually this, and mainly because it's just, you're gonna grind these down eventually. Um, but what you're gonna do is you're gonna put it underneath and you're gonna run two steel, they're longer steel bolts. You'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. There's only a couple of them in there. There's only about four. Um, you're gonna run it through the plastic, through the bottom plate, and then we're gonna screw on our, um, our standoffs. And we want to just kind of get them slightly snug and then right after that we're going to take some slightly longer actually you know what i'm going to use the six mil buttons just because there seems to be more six mil buttons so i'm going to take some six mil button screws which are the smallest button screws and we're going to put those in Forgive me, this is the first time I've built one of these production model ones, so, um, uh, you know, all of this hardware is not necessarily new to me, but as far as where to put it and what they give you and how much they give you, I don't, I'm like learning as I'm going along, because it's better to get this video out, people are asking for it, and uh, I don't have another one to build and get familiar with it, so I'm just going to do it as we go. So... We're gonna put that in. We got our camera plate, or our camera standoffs ready to go. I'm gonna slip this plate in with the microphone backwards. And we're gonna kinda shimmy all of this in here. You'll, you'll feel it, it'll fit real nicely. But the USB port is gonna be on the side. If you're looking at it from the back, it's gonna be on the left side. If you're looking at it from the front, it's gonna be on the right. And it kinda sits literally right behind this camera plate in these little slots. There's actually little slots on the back here. You can see them cut out. That's where your camera plate's gonna sit. Or sorry, not your camera plate, but your uh, little OSD board. So if you wanted to, you could set it up like this and you would see how, how nicely it fit. So that's how it's gonna sit behind these standoffs. So I might just go ahead and do that. And this is a tight fit because everything Impulse RC fits really, really well together because the tighter the tolerance is, the more durable the stuff, all right? This build is very, very nice. I'm going to shimmy those in there. There we go hear that click like maybe loosen up this front standoff a little bit don't stab yourself in the neck with a two mil driver it'd be a bad day maybe give it a little little love tap all right a little love tap helped out Go ahead and tighten up these standoffs in the front. Just make sure when you're doing this that the um, all the standoffs have the flat side to the carbon because that it's literally that tight. You have to make sure that the flat side of this hexagonal hexagonal standoff is to the carbon, otherwise it's not going to fit. Now we can go ahead and plug back in our OSD board, and we have our VD, VTX and our camera board. We can tilt our camera forward and plug back in our camera. 
Again, with all these short little wires, it's kind of a pain in the butt, but you know it's going to pay off when it's all clean and done. We can leave this little thing out the side right now because eventually we are going to um, plug that in and change some OSD stuff. So that's kind of how you're looking at it right now. Uh, the next, we're going to take some standoffs. We're going to take our shorter standoffs and some 6 mil bolts, and we're going to put them not in the very back, but the, the next open holes. We're going to put our small standoffs on the bottom. And again, just kind of get those snug. Again, 6 mil buttons. It's a 6 mil button. Little tiny aluminum nugget. I'm going to put that in here. We're going to use our little standoff, the smallest one that we have. We're going to put it here. Again, these are 2 mil. They are aluminum, so don't tighten them crazy or you'll strip them out. Um, and then in the very back, we can get away with running our... Uh, I would run like an 8 mil at this point, or you could run even steel in the back. But um, I'm just going to run an 8 mil button. I don't know if this is necessary, but I would run a thicker button in the back because why not? You have them. You're not going to use them anywhere else. Go ahead and do that. Tighten those up a little bit because we're not going to have to really do anything with those other than mount our uh, antenna to them. So we've got our short standoffs. And we got our long standoffs in the back. If you look from the top, you'll notice everything's flat except for this. And that's where this little nugget comes into play. This is going to be where our VTX mounts. Um, and yeah, that mounts on top of these little guys right here. And we will go into that right now. All right, so next we need to set up our VTX so that we can mount it to the actual standoffs and frame. So what we're going to do is we're going to get our VTX antenna out. And we're going to get our VTX, and uh, we're going to screw these together, okay? We're going to need uh, like an 8 mil little wrench tool, and maybe a pair of duckbills or something. I'd get this kind of snug, not super, super gnarly tight, but just snug it up. And uh, yeah, so we're, now we're looking at this. we got the Triumph Pro right there, and we got our 5-volt Unify right here. What we're going to do is we're going to take this guy... And we're going to shit, it's got a little hole right here. And we're going to put that over the back side of the antenna. And we're going to use two little 6 mil um, aluminum uh, bolts or aluminum screws here. And we're going to actually run them through the back side of this mount. And that's going to screw directly into the little pigtail that comes with the Unify. And this is going to make life super, super easy. And I tightened up the other one a little too much so that I couldn't even get that one all lined up. So we got that lined up. Snug those up. And with aluminum with anodization on them, you don't necessarily need Loctite because it's not going to un undo itself. So this is what you're left with. You got your Unify here and you got your uh, little guy here. You want the Unify to be uh, buttoned down and you want the hole to be on the bottom. So I should have probably said that earlier, but... When you mount it, you want the hole to be on the bottom, and you want the Unify to be face down like this. So button down, and then we're going to be mounting it in like this, right? Okay, so hole on the bottom, Unify like that, mounted to where the button is off. The button is on the same side as the hole, I guess would be the best way to describe that. Now, one thing that we can do before we go ahead and lock all this down is we're going to cut the heat shrink off of the button. That way, if the button, if the VTX gets really hot, which we know these things do get really hot, it's not going to shrink and like depress the button on accident. Um, and it also makes life a little bit easier when you're trying to uh, set these things up later, um, just so that you don't have any heat shrink around the button itself, okay? So let's go ahead and mount this guy in here. And how you're gonna do that is you're actually gonna mount it to the top plate First. So if we take the top plate and we look at the top plate going on here, this is pretty much how the top plate is going to sit and we're going to want our VTX somewhat like this, okay? Um, now, yes, there are some long, there are some long aluminum screws and I'm pretty sure if you put them in here they're not going to hold anything. Yes, so this is the case. Well, that's going to make, not necessarily a problem, but you'll see why. Um, let's go ahead and mount the VTX and then we'll do that. 
So eventually you're going to need these two, these two longer Allen screws right here. We're going to take our VTX and we're going to actually mount it double-sided sticky tape to the top plate, basically right behind where the camera stuff is. All right. So let me get some double-sided sticky tape. Um, I thought I had a piece out earlier. I did, but I'll just cut some more. You don't want to use a crazy amount of double-sided sticky tape. It's just enough. I'd probably put some on the front and on the back like so. So we got double-sided sticky tape like this. We're going to go ahead and like test fit, make sure everything's good. And I'm going to peel the sticky tape off or the backing. This is really easy with a razor blade. There's no top or bottom to the top plate, so just don't worry about it. We're going to go ahead and place this right about here. Hopefully that'll be that'll suffice. Yeah, that'll work. All right, so we're placing that right about there. We're going to kind of shimmy this guy up into a little coil. And uh, in reality, we should just be able to plop that right on there, but we need to finish some things first. I want to make the antenna, um, get that mounted, and then we're going to flash some stuff and make sure our video transmitter is unlocked because it'll be kind of a pain in the ass once the whole thing is put together. And we also need to put the motors on. So let's go ahead and I'll build this antenna and then we'll put the motors on and then we'll mount the flight controller and we'll be good. All right guys, so to make the, um, to make this antenna, you're gonna need three zip ties, not two. You're gonna need three little zip ties like this and you're gonna need two pieces of heat shrink, probably not that long, but you'll see in a second. So two pieces of heat shrink and three zip ties. So what we're going to do first is we're going to actually measure the antenna with heat shrink. So I'm going to take this antenna and I'm going to kind of measure it up against this uh, zip tie. And what I want is I want the little L bend to basically come out right at the top of where the zip tie ends. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a piece of heat shrink, I'm going to kind of measure it and see that, hey, okay, the heat shrink needs to be cut to here so that it ends right at the tip. I'm gonna slip the heat shrink over the top of the zip tie and the antenna. I'm gonna shift this down all the way to the bottom. Um, try to not cover the joint entirely. And uh, yeah, once you get that, I'm gonna go ahead and heat shrink this guy. Some people hate on this antenna, but you know it works really, really well. I don't have any problems with it, and I've been using it for a hot minute now. So, you know, to each his own. I'm gonna go ahead and cut off the end because I can see where the antenna stops right there. I could probably cut off a little bit more. Um, so yeah, that's the end of the antenna. This is the tall part. What we're gonna do next is we're gonna take a zip tie and we're gonna kind of half zip it and we're gonna run it over the top of this antenna and down the standoff so that you end up with something that kind of looks like kind of looks like this so I've got one zip tie coming out directly out the back kind of like an L and I've got this other zip tie with the antenna up it like that and then you can see this you know little ground plane right here comes directly at the back we're going to take our other piece of heat shrink and just kind of eyeball it measure it to the end right there and say all right well you know if I cut this here and slip this over here it should be perfectly lengthy hey hey sorry a piece of foam trying to melt its ass on there so we'll get that all shrunk down like this
All right. We can see where it ends, so we'll go ahead and snip the end off right there. And uh, the only other thing is we'd push that down. We'd run our other zip tie over the top and just zip tie the top down. And this is really just for support at that point. So I'm running two zip ties on the back so that it holds this antenna together. Now what we can do with this is we can actually peel this up with our double-sided sticky tape, take our um, antenna excess, and just kind of smash it down underneath that double-sided sticky tape. That's going to keep our antenna excess out of the way, and it is going to basically just make things real nice and tidy. And what I'm doing right now is just bending this antenna so that it's not at a sharp angle. And it comes out like that. And that's kind of what you're in, you're left with. You're left with this immortal L, which is what I like to call it. Okay? So, with that done, let's go ahead and uh, go ahead and mount our motors. So, we're going to need to open up our motors and we'll... We'll end up using these guys here in a second. I'll talk about that if you want to use those or you don't and you want to make your setup a little lighter. But we're going to go ahead and open up these motors and I'll get them mounted and we'll go from there. So this is the V3 Stout. So this is again a 2306 1750 KV. The difference between this is the entirely new bell design. Um, the KV is now 1750 KV. It's a lot more durable now that the bell spokes are recessed down into the bell still steel sh still a steel shaft um, a two point a two millimeter thing and also a nine mil bearing which gives you a lot more smoothness and a lot more durability because instead of there being a like three mil uh, shaft inside the bearing situation it's now a four mil shaft and you got this five mil hollow steel shaft tip so we open these guys up get them all kind of prepped and ready make sure we get our pants whichever pants we want to use. So I'll just dump all that out. I'm going to use the low pro pants on these. So how these work is you just slip these over the top here and uh, they key onto the bottom of the motor giving you a motor base. If you want to run these others that come with the motor from the factory, this clips on and gives you a little bit more protection around the outside. But obviously you can't run of them all of them at the same time. So you can either run without, you can run the low profile pants that do key onto the bottom like so and then you can also run these guys which are the tall ones if you're flying around bandos and whatnot and you want to you want that maximum protection so again the v3 stout i'm gonna go ahead and open all these up and get all these prepped and we will mount them to the aircraft All right, so we got our motors ready to go with our bases on them. Make sure you put the bases on them before you screw them down or solder them to the aircraft because it is a hole that you cannot, like I guess you could cut it and slip it on later, but specifically designed to be put on before you put it on the aircraft. Now, here's where you can, you can make a choice. If you want to run these plastic pieces, they do go underneath the motor and sit like this on the frame and give you kind of like a slider, a skid pad, um, and protection for the bottom of the motor, also protection for the end of the arm, and they look really, really good. Now, I use them on one of my frames and I don't use them on another. If you are gonna use these guys, you wanna run steel screws. So they come with some steel screws in here. Um, that's what these guys are for, there's a bunch of them. There's steel screws that come in the pack, okay? You can use 
all of these steel screws. Um, preferably, you would want to run, you know, two to three per motor or even four. I have gotten away with just running two diagonal from each other with steel screws and not had an issue. So, um, you know, I guess we'll build this one with that. If you don't want to, the original way that I fly my other aircraft, which I'll show you here. This is the way this is the way that I'm flying my other aircraft. These are aluminum and they the steel kit does come with aluminum bolts so that you can run this way and then I'm running this foam like this just a kind of fat piece underneath all the way towards the end and as long as you can get it without it poking off the end and this is the most lightweight setup you're actually gonna this is the 690 or sorry 590 gram setup if you don't run the plastic but I am running this plastic so if you run the plastics you're gonna gain a little bit of weight you know probably 15 to 20 grams um, because you are running the plastic and the steel screws but hey you know sometimes it doesn't necessarily matter in our case I'm gonna go ahead and run the steel screws on this one so how we're gonna do that is we're gonna run two bolts to try to save a little bit of weight and uh, we don't really need to use Loctite on these but you can if you want because since we are running a, uh, a little bit of pressure with the plastic it's gonna kinda add and make like this odd little Loctite simulation um, since you have some pressure on something. If you didn't have any pressure and it was like direct carbon I would advise running Loctite but you do want to check your screws every now and then and make sure that you are putting uh, an aircraft up in the air that doesn't have loose hardware because that will affect the flight characteristics and also could potentially result and uh, you know stuff falling off midair which is not what you want forgive me while I put these on come on there you are alright two motors on let's go for three like I said, I'm only running two steel screws on these because that's how I've always run it for weight reduction and it doesn't seem to affect the durability. I wish I could find this. There we go. It doesn't matter what screw you're using, like where, as long as they're diagonal from each other. And it might help if I use the, go away with the far away one first and then come in with this one. Yep, that was a lot quicker. Okay, so I'm putting a moderate amount of tension on these. Nothing crazy. Again, these are button head, so even though they're steel, they're still fairly not as strong as like a cap head or something and you are tightening down onto like a piece of plastic so just you know don't tighten them down too hard okay so we got those on there and we're gonna go ahead and solder these to the flight controller or sorry the ESC itself and I'm gonna run them directly in now I will put these cap guards on here the ESC or, or sorry the wire guards but I'm going to go ahead and solder these on first. I'll cut them to length and then solder them on. And uh, yeah, we'll do that. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run these wires as straight as I can over to these ESC connections. And I'm basically just going to eyeball it. Make sure you don't cut them too short. But you don't want to cut them too long either so you're just kind of eyeballing it one of them is going to be shorter than another obviously cuz they're they're going to be uh, slightly different lengths just make sure you don't cut them too short 
So when you're eyeballing this stuff, air on the side of too long rather than on the side of too short. You can always shorten them up later. But I'm going to try to get as close as I can so that I don't have to shorten them up. If you've never done this before, I would probably cut one at a time just so that you're making sure that you're not cutting them too short because it is a pain in the butt if you cut them too short, which I have probably done because, you know, hey, when you talk about something, doing something wrong, you're probably going to do it wrong. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to strip all of these and tend them, like I said, you should do for every connection that you do. So strip and tin, strip and tin. Okay, so we're ready to tin. Make sure all of your wires are nice and uh, twisted so that they're not going to have a fray out and like a short between two of the phases of the motor because that would be a bad day. Might not actually cause anything to blow up, but it will definitely cause you a headache. So again, make sure all of the phases don't have any odd ends sticking off. Make sure when you're doing this and tinning and you're tinning say you're tinning over the flight controller or something, just make sure some solder blob doesn't fall off and fall on top of the flight controller, because believe me, that can cause you a headache as well. Ask me how I know. I have done these things before. I have made these mistakes. You learn from me or you learn from yourself, but you probably will learn better if you fuck it up and then have to learn and have to pay out of pocket because that's what I had to do forever and then eventually you're just like alright is it worth the risk and you can decide with your pocketbook if it's worth the risk or the time waiting for things to ship so all of these are tinned I'm gonna kinda move them out of the way I wanna run the motors in directly so like I wanna run it to where the motors gonna come in the center wire is going to be on the center. I put a little bend in them and then I'll take a pair of needle nose pliers and I will grab this front motor wire and this can be kind of tedious so bear with me. Grab your next motor wire get them in there And when you're done, it looks something like this. And I'm going to just shorten this wire a little bit by tilting it, or lengthen it, sorry. Lengthen it rather by pulling it towards so that I have a little bit more slack because that one was pretty short. Alright, so we're done with that one. I'm going to continue and finish off the rest of these guys again putting a small bend in the wire preferably going from the farthest out motor or sorry the closest in motor to this basically the outside and then you're gonna come in mainly because if you do it the other way it's a little bit more it's a little bit harder to do because you got that one that's really close to the carbon. And this side may be a little short. Again, don't hold heat on anything for too long. You want it, you want it to be as clean as possible. There you go. Go to the other side. 
Again, bend these guys at a little bit of a 90. Makes life easier when you are soldering them directly because you want them to be vertically soldered rather than directly in. Again, be careful when you're doing it on this side because now you're dealing with some pins and some connectors and if you aren't careful you might you might heat some heat some crap up and melt some stuff which is never good alrighty so we're almost almost mounted this is pretty much why I went to a four in one because it made the build so much faster before I'd be soldering ESC and motor wires for like days and now I can put on all four motors especially in this configuration oh wow I missed a spot missed a spot yeah with this configuration it just goes on goes together so much faster and it's so much easier to repair if you end up breaking a motor and you have to replace a stator which is rare but again just makes life a little less hectic so just checking my solder joints making sure everything's good to go and uh, you know double checking stuff so now what we can do is we can take these guys which we got with the kit originally these slip over the tops of the motor wires to keep them a little bit tidier than uh, they look right now because they do look kind of janky right now so what we're going to do is we're going to slip make sure these wires are straight underneath here I'm going to slip these over and they do go a certain way and once you get that on there you can put some double sided or not double sided just run some um, electrical tape over it and uh, call it a day so I'm going to do that now run some electrical tape over the top and uh, I just like to run it like right over the middle I just cut my nails and got no nails no mo just like right over the middle try to keep the wires as tidy as possible underneath there I know it's kinda hard sometimes hey 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 I'm trying to give you guys some like perspective with this piece of wood on here but in reality it's just causing me a headache get out of there that I'm going a little bit farther back all right So we've got one of those on. Go ahead and fix our wires up, make them look a little pretty. Shift them around in there, make sure they're tucked real nice and tidy like. And then um, do it again. Do it four times. Tidy, tidy. Get out of here. Straight lines. Tidy wires, not tidy whiteies, tidy wires. Slip that over there. Take one of these, run it over the top like just so. Get a cat hair out of there because you don't want to be cloning my cat. Run it like that, snip it, and you good to go, my dog. All right, let's try it again. Getting faster at this. And again, guys, this is like, I've been building quads for a while, but 
this is a new build to me and it's taking me just as long as you see see it taking it's not a uh, I haven't really like cut much out of this video so when you talk about like how long is this gonna take me it's probably gonna take you about I don't know if you've never done anything before ever with a mini quad it's probably gonna take you anywhere from three to four hours if you have you know you might even be able to get it done in closer to two that was kind of the goal that I was shooting for um, was being able to build a full quad in like two hours because that's you know that's nice being able to do that but it's not necessary but it is nice Okay, so we got our our motors all mounted and our wires all tidied up. Get our motor wires all tidy and nice. Okay, so there we go. Motor wires are tidy. We got our little thing here. Let's go ahead and get that out of here. We got our VTX set up. Let's get that plugged in. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to plug it in and we're going to make sure everything works and then we're going to set everything up and once we set everything up then we can put it fully together and uh, it'll be done and we test fly it make sure it works sorry with everything being so short that can be kind of a pain in the butt to plug in but it'll make sense in a minute so we're good to go right here we got everything plugged in we're just gonna I'm gonna plug it in we're gonna make sure everything works we're gonna set it up as far as like opening the video transmitter binding the receiver you know setting up the flight controller taking the OSD off the camera and whatnot and then uh, yeah we'll put it together fully put some props on it test hover it we'll be good to go all right so now that we got everything set up uh, as far as the build is concerned, we're going to check and make sure everything's plugged in correctly. So what I'm going to do is get a multimeter. You don't have to do this, but this is just me double checking, make sure I soldered everything up. Just make sure it's not shorted out. So it's beeping. That means there's some capacitance there, but it's not directly shorted out. Then you can get what's called a smoke stopper. I don't even know where I got this one. I think Kevin gave it to me and we're going to plug it in. So let's see if anything explodes. Okay, so we're good to go on that front. Our VTX is powered on. Everything is working as far as I can tell. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to actually unplug this just cause we now know it's gonna work. And I'm gonna plug in my computer. Uh, I'm gonna plug in the FC to the computer. And I'm going to go over here and I'm gonna open up the KISS GUI, which is out here. Uh, we could be binding our radio right now, so Welcome if you want to kill two birds with one stone while you're waiting on this, uh, you can totally like go in here and hold down bind, and then that's going to say, oh, hey, we're ready to go. You're going to update, and you're just binding, okay? So the radio is binding right now. What we're going to do is we're going to go here, connect to the KISS FC. We can do all this stuff while we're... You know, just make sure you don't interrupt that bind process. We're going to go to the FC flasher and we're going to flash on the latest firmware, which in my case, um, I think there's actually, I can select a remote firmware. I think it's available now, 39B. Nope. Um, so there is a firmware, which I'll put a link to the description in the bottom. It's uh, called 40i. So if I select local firmware and I have it on my desktop and I go to KISS, uh, PIDs and then KISS firmwares then there's this RC40i hex file and then I hit flash and that's going to go ahead and start flashing as you can see the progress bar down here is going our receiver is updating so we're killing two birds with one stone as the receiver is updating we are also flashing on the new KISS FC firmware so as we wait for this to continue and go we do need an internet connection to get the KISS FC so that you can 
activate it once you flash the new firmware on there. I, I don't know if you saw when I first started it, it said activate KISSFC because they are serial number based and the firmware is all in, 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 in loop, like closed proprietary stuff. So, so our ESC is now flashed, uh, or sorry, our FC is now flashed. See, it came back up on the screen and says we want to activate this flight controller. So yes, I would like to. Our receiver is almost done, but right before we get there, we can go up and we can put in these KISS PIDs, which are PIDs. Uh, if we go to my desktop and I go to KISS PIDs and I go to Apex and I go to 819, 812, 19, light. So this is going to be a, I have different PIDs for a heavy and, um, and lighter quad. I'll put both of those in the description. So anyways, those are the PIDs for that particular for this a little bit heavier quad. Actually, you know what? This one's not gonna be running a seven, so I'll I'll just run a hero or whatever. We can leave it. It's pretty much the same. Um, our our uh, flight can, or sorry, our receiver is done now, so it has a green light. We're good. We're bound, so we don't have to worry about that anymore. We put our pids on here. If you notice up here in the corner, do take note of this upside down, 90 degrees counterclockwise. Make sure that is the case for the actual. Um, for the actual ESC, okay? Because if you don't do that and you try to spool it up, the motors are not gonna be in the correct spot and it's not going to work. So you gotta make sure motor output mapping is exactly like this, upside down, 90 degrees counterclockwise. And then the PIDs and whatnot, all of that's the same, okay? So, you know, at this point, I'd probably just go ahead, unplug and then replug back in so that, you know, everything starts fresh. Uh, I'm going to plug back in. I'm going to turn my radio off because I don't necessarily need it on. I am going to turn on this little um, screen right here. And I'm going to plug in a battery at this point. So why am I plugging in a battery at this point? Well, because I need to flash the ESCs themselves. So I'm going to go in here. I'm going to connect. I'm going to go to ESC flasher. I'm going to say I know what I'm doing. I don't have any props on the thing. I'm going to say select remote firmware. And I'm going to go to KISS 25 amp. Make sure you're on KISS 25 amp 4 in 1. And I'm going to click 121A beep. Not voice, 121A beep. That's the one that I use. Uh, you know, whatever. You can put whatever you want on there, but that's the one that I use. So it's disarmed. It's good to go. It's cutting through right now. Okay, so what we want to do now is we want to unlock our video transmitter. How we're going to do that is we're going to hold down this button. It's kind of hard to see. Hold down the button till both lights come on. Hold down the button again till both lights come on. Hold down the button again until both lights come on. And we're going to hold that for 20 seconds. And then the blue light will go off. And then that will basically mean that your video transmitter is unlocked. So any moment now. And I'll, again, I'm killing two birds with one stone. I'm flashing the ESCs while I'm unlocking the video transmitter. So now the video transmitter is unlocked. I got three orange beeps, which means that I have power. I have access to power management now. I can go from 25 milliwatts all the way up to whatever I want. I'm going to change it to race band, which is two orange beeps and five blue beeps. Two, three, four, five. I'm going to hold that again. I'm going to still leave it on 25 milliwatts because... I don't know. This this sequence is kind of a pain in the butt. Just look at the Unify user manual. Um, and I'm going to go to Race Band 1 because even though it was on Race Band 1. So I'm on Race Band 1 now. And what I want to do in here is I want to go on. I have this plugged in as well, which is like an OSD board. I want to go in. I'm going to hold up. And that's going to bring me into the OSD. So I hold up on this. I go down. I'm going to clear the entire OSD. I'm going to come down and turn off all of the OSDs because I don't like them. And then, then we're done. So now I've completely set up my camera and the video transmitter, except if you wanted to change channels or change power output, you could do that. So we can go ahead and unplug the quad itself. Go ahead and unplug from the computer because it needs to fully power down before you can plug it back in and you won't get any reading if you leave the FC plug back in. It has to fully power down. So what we're going to do now is, um, you know, we could plug back in to the computer and we can plug back in to the computer again. 
our plug back into the quad, go in here. You gotta make sure all the OSD stuff comes up on here, which it is. Um, we're gonna go to ESC flasher, click again, and I'm pretty sure it's, uh, we, we see that the KISS 25 amp, we're running 21.1 or 121A, um, and then we're gonna reverse one and three. Counterclockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise, clockwise. So now, and it turned off because we have this um, this thing on here. So if I were to plug it in, we're good to go. I can arm it, arm it. I'm checking motor direction from the back. It should be counterclockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise, clockwise. When I arm and give it a little bit of throttle, It's gonna ramp up. This is a normal thing, guys. That's normal. The I-term is ramping, okay? So if you put props on it, it's not gonna do that. Now, I get that question all the time. People are like, why, I got, it's doing this thing. It's like I touch the throttle and all of a sudden it's ramping to the moon. It's pretty typical, guys. Put some props on it and fly it. As long as you put in an input and it doesn't go and do all any kind of weird stuff, you're good to go. If you've done it wrong, it will and do all kinds of funky stuff. As long as you got the board orientation for the ESC correct and you have counterclockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise, and clockwise. So again, you have one, two, three, four. You're clockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise, counterclockwise. You're good to go. Okay? So we can unplug this and assemble the quad because now we are fully done configuring everything we need to configure. Um, and let's go back to the bench and finish this guy up. All right, so we're going to be finishing up this build by, you know, putting the top on and whatnot. So we can go ahead and uh, disconnect this if we want to. Okay, maybe not. Uh, I was trying to disconnect that because I was going to take this off. But, you know, maybe you want to use that later so you can just tuck it down in there. So we'll tuck that, you know, control down in there. And we will run our VTX again in that little kind of bendy swoosh method. And I'm going to run this down through the top here. These big long, remember these big aluminum screws? I'm going to run those down. I'm going to run through this mount again with the hole for the this guy on the bottom. The hole to slip it in and out. Um, to slip the... the little cable in and out of the thing if you ever need to fix it or something. And then we are going to run the pigtail on the front side of that. And we're just going to line these up and take our two millimeter Allen, screw these guys down. tighten stuff up a little bit now I wouldn't advise like tightening like crazy but you can tighten stuff up okay so now we are mounted the top plate is on uh, as far as the rest of the hardware goes you can use uh, these out these little buttons the six mil buttons um, are what you're gonna use you're gonna want to clip these guys in these are your little K plate uh, clips they clip in get you all flush and you're going to use these six mil um, buttons, tighten them up as you know tight as you want. Don't over tighten them because they are button head and they are pretty fragile as far as like, they're not as bad as they used to be, but this is, if you're going to strip a, a screw out or a bolt, you need, you're going to do it with this if you're going to do it. So just, you know, be aware, don't put too much pressure. If you do, you know, it's not the end of the world, you got extras, but yeah and I'll run the 8 mil for 8 mil in the front and back because it doesn't seem like I have enough 6 mil so we'll run 8 millimeter buttons in the very front and the very back just for structure give you a little bit more um, a little bit more metal down in the um, standoff itself make it a little bit harder to break so again 8 mil in the front and these are all buttons again I'm gonna run an 8 mil in the front and two 8 mils in the back like so. 
tighten it. Don't. If you're gonna, when you're tightening it and you're putting pressure, push down. Don't just don't put. Don't not put pressure. Once you get to the end, push down and twist ever so slightly so that you're not gonna um, strip those guys out. So next, we're gonna put on this. You do have the option to put on this rubber thing if you don't like Velcro. I personally use Velcro, so that's the one I'm gonna use. And again, this is like, if I were gonna build my setup, this is what I would be doing, because this is obviously me building a setup for you guys. This is what I would do if I were to build it, because this is my this is my setup on my aircraft. So label that, or level that guy out. Get him all nice and pretty on there. Um, you can take a zip tie, uh, a little zip tie, and there's actually holes in this little mounting thing right here. You can run this zip tie. I would bend it first so that it doesn't get away from you and get like deep in the, deep in the chassis. So bend it up, then slip it through this hole right here. Um, and what that's going to allow you to do is that's going to give you the option to tighten down onto this pigtail so that you don't end up ripping the pads off of your FC or your ESC. So again, shift this around, get it to the length that you want. You can use like a, you can use like a screwdriver or something and push these wires a little deeper in there if you want which they aren't going that much deeper, so I'll just leave them where they are. And, uh, yeah, so there you go. You got your zip tie holding that guy on, and that's gonna keep everything nice and tidy um, for when you're strapping down your battery later. So zip tie there. Good to go. Now, the one thing that people cry about and ask me all kinds of crazy awesome questions about, what the heck is this foam wedge? Foam wedge. Peel it off. It's got adhesive on the bottom. It's a 30 degree mount. We'll go ahead and plug back in our heat gun because this is kind of the crucial thing about these little foam things. Anything that you're going to stick on with adhesive, please heat it up first. And don't put it on backwards. It goes like this. So you heat this guy up, you heat the, the carbon up, not crazy, but you know, just enough. Heat it up. If you heat it too much, you'll see it starting to change shapes. And then you're going to mount this guy. It does hang off a little bit on the apex because this piece of foam was specifically designed for the, the alien and it's just ever so slightly wider. So there you go, foam piece stuck on push that sucker on there what you're going to do is you're going to take a piece of velcro a piece of this type of velcro and you're going to put it on there and then you're going to put the uh, the hook side velcro on here and you're going to put the loop side velcro on the actual gopro and then you run your strap through so if we're running straps through i'm running my ethics gopro strap which has this has excuse me has this nice uh like heat sensitive sticky portion to it which makes life a lot easier you're going to slip that in here, <sighs> dude, I'm breaking a sweat putting this strap in. Come on, guys, get the damn camera, get the damn camera mounts figured out. All right, so we got a strap in. We're gonna run this loop over the top here. Get it ready for later. I'm gonna put in the rest of these screws that hold this damn camera in. And then we're going to put our other straps on, and then we're going to adjust our camera angle. And then we should be done. Okay, so what you want camera angle, if you want 25 degrees, there's just kind of, kind of just eyeball it. It's about 25 degrees right there, maybe a little less. And I'm just you know, eyeballing it because there's not really any increments. That's the one downside to having these smaller cameras and having a more simple mount. And this is also kind of a pain in the butt to get to. So really the only complaint I have as of anything is these camera cases, but it really has to do with the camera case itself, not necessarily the, and the lack of just consistency with these damn camera cases. 
Okay, so we're 25 degrees, we're locked down. We got our little antenna situated like that. We're good to go. All we need to really do is put on these guys, and I always do this. So, coming across here like that. And then running the opposite in the back, going on top of the uh, on top of the antenna, so we're not pinching anything. So there you go, that's it. Um, if you were to put Velcro here, um, I don't know if I have any, but let me do that so no one cries about it. All right, so if you were to put Velcro on top of here. You're basically just going to do this. This is a little too long. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to peel this Velcro off here, or the backing. I'm going to heat up the Velcro and the pad pretty thoroughly. Don't burn your fingers. It gets hot. Don't keep it in one place for too long. Ow. Burning me. You stick that down like that. You're gonna fucking press it down a bunch. Get your Velcro on there. Make sure you tap it down as much as you can. And then we're good to go. On that front, how I would mount my GoPro. Take a GoPro, sticky or a foam, or sorry, Velcro on the bottom. Mount that guy there. This is the biggest mistake people make when mounting GoPros. And they always cry about how my foam wedge killed their GoPro. Foam wedge didn't kill a GoPro. You mounted it incorrectly. I'm sorry. You got to mount it over the top corner like this. Then it becomes compressive and adds all of this extra support and safety to the GoPro when you mount it over the corner. Don't mount it over the top. Mount it over the corner. Okay. Then got your battery here. Velcro on the battery, tuck your little nugget, push it as far forward as you can. If you want to check CG, grab right in the middle over the flight controller. If the CG is off, it'll do that. If the CG is right, it should float effortlessly if you hold it like that. It's going back and forth. It's not fighting me in any way, so CG is accurate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to strap down the back first. Tighten that sucker. I usually use a shorter strap in the back. We do have shorter straps online. These are the 250 millimeter ones. And the reason I like the longer one up front is because I tuck this under here and the shorter strap in the back so that there's not any excess. So we got the 250 mil strap for the front and the 230 mil for the back. And then you plug in here and everything's tight. Tight and neat, out of the way of the props. Good to go, quads balanced ready to rip okay so put some props on this sucker let's test hover it and uh, we're good to go so this is the ethics prop bag for those of you that are wondering it's basically a you got a bag for your dead props counterclockwise and clockwise Pretty cool little thing, pretty nice to have out in the field. You're gonna put your counterclockwise props, pink up front always, not necessarily always, but so counterclockwise, clockwise, we're gonna make sure we get our prop nuts on there. Can tighten down our props. Guys, tighten down your props tight. I always get people saying, I'm down on power, blah, blah, blah. Well, you watch the video and usually the prop is just loose. If you hear a squeaky noise, the prop is loose. Tighten that sucker. Get it tight. Don't tighten it too much, but tighten it until it feels snug. And then go a little more, okay? So, props on, we're good to go. 
power this sucker up. Give it a test hover. Alright, plug her in. Got the props on right. Spool the motors. I have an idle up situation. If you haven't seen my idle up video, check it out. It's a way to set up your radio. I'll put a link in the description below. So that's with no gyro activated. Arm the gyro. And I was just making sure it didn't freak out. If you hold your foot on it, you spool it up and it tries to go, Rah! bad day. So it's acting normal. So we pick it up. Success Apex, Mr. Steel Edition. I hope you enjoyed. Have fun. Go out there and rip. If you're curious about the OSD and whatnot, you can check out my previous videos where I have the DVR set up. And uh, as far as like DVR, you can see what it shows. It gives you milliamp consumption, battery voltage, and you can also adjust the PIDs and everything and whatnot inside the OSD. I don't know. There's a lot of really cool stuff that is probably not going to be in this video. Honestly, it's just there's just a lot of stuff that this can do that I don't use. I want it to be as simple as possible, and I want it to do what I needed to do. And everything that I showed you is exactly how I run it. This is exactly the rig that I go out and fly every single day. I'll show you the weight real quick, and then we'll be done. All right. So if you were to copy everything that I did to a T. This exact quad that just flew with a 6S 1100 milliamp Thunder Power battery and a Hero 5, sorry, a Session 5 GoPro, exactly the way that we built it with the plastic on it, not the plastic in the back, the antenna in the back that I made. That is 612 grams. Again, like I said, we're still steel screws and we're running the plastics. If you take the steel screws off and you run it how I'm running it on my other quads, which is this quad, which is the, the super lightweight version, which doesn't have the plastics and it's using the aluminum, um, is using the aluminum uh, motor bolts. Then uh, we are right at 590 grams, basically 591 grams with a session and a 1300 4S. If you run the fatter setup with the plastics, um, and a hero, you're looking at roughly 655 grams. So again, it's about 40 grams more than this, not only because you're running the plastics and whatnot, but I'm also running thicker props, and you're running also this hero camera. So, and again, the Hero 8 just came out, so it'll be 14% lighter, apparently. This thing weighs like 114 grams or something like that, 115. So, anyways, thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.